Good morning. It seems natural that the Christian church should adopt the lighting of candles as a Christian custom, since man is brought into the uncreated light of life by the Son of God. This circled wreath symbolizes life without end. Four candles set in the wreath represent the four weeks until Christmas Day, as well as the thousands of years people awaited the coming of the Messiah. The lighting of an additional candle each week in Advent marks the growing anticipation for the light, which came into the world at Jesus' birth. Lighting the candles helps us remember the one who said, I am the light of the world. On this first Sunday of Advent, we light the candle of hope. Hope is our assurance that God will finish all that he has started. Hope is our confidence that God will do all that he has promised. All the promises of God are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He is our hope today and forever. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Let's pray. Lord, it is, it is amazing how a, <clears throat> a simple act of lighting a candle can um, quiet our hearts and strengthen our hearts and reach uh, deep into our soul and stir our affections for you. <clears throat> and we pray that your grace will be abundant to us now. We thank you for Jesus. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. We're going to read from Psalm 130. And so if you have a Bible, uh, please open it and join with me in Psalm 130 for this morning. We'll read all eight verses. Um, and we will celebrate the hope of God that was given to us through Jesus that we now possess and we abide in. Because of Jesus. Psalm 130, a song of ascents. Out of the depths I cried to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. O oh, Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. This is the word of the Lord. We're all looking for it. And I contend that actually we all refuse to live without it. And what is it that I'm speaking of? It's hope. We're all looking for hope. We're all, we, we all refuse to live without it. Somehow, somewhere, some way, we crave it, we pursue it, and we're restless until we find hope. We're all looking for that one thing that we can, we can always count on. We're looking for that one place to find courage, that one person, that one thing that will give us courage as we face hardship or pain or darkness or sorrow or whatever it may be. We're restless until we find it. Because none of us enjoy living in darkness, do we? None of us will live hopeless. We will give in. When we are truly hopeless, we know from our own experience that life is disappointing, isn't it? We know that life is certainly unpredictable. We know that we need light. We know that we need hope. And let me be Captain Obvious for us this morning. 2020, <laughs> it's one for the ages. <laughs> this has been a year in which it seems virtually everything that we will look to for hope has been attacked. 
Everything that we lean on, everything we find refuge in, or at least we're tempted to from time to time, has been attacked. It's been knocked over. Our health has been under attack. Think about work and think about finances. Think about something simple that we assume, just community life, the movement of the community, the coming and the going, the freedom of community life. So many accomplishments, so many plans. It's funny to me that on uh, the first Sunday of January 2020, how many pastors preached sermons called 2020 Vision? (laughs) They thought they saw clearly, right? And then March 2020 rolled around. And it was a wrecking ball to all of our clear plans and all of our ambitions and all of our goals and so forth and so on. Yet we sit here on this last Sunday of November 2020 full of hope. Why? Because of Jesus Christ. Jesus is alive. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the rock that we can build our lives upon. So while everything else around us is shifting sand, we know the rock. And by his grace and for his glory, we have planted our lives on the rock. We know he reigns. So we have hope. And so this this is the first Sunday of Advent, as Miss Judy already shared with us. Thank you for that. Advent may be, may be an odd custom to you, maybe a foreign custom. If, you are, if you're raised in what's called a liturgical church, you probably know Advent just as much as you know Easter. If you're raised in a church like a Baptist church, you may think Advent. What in the world is Advent? Well, I'm glad you asked. Advent is a time of reflection. It's a time of remembrance. It is a time of preparation. And it begins the Sunday closest to November 30th. And it's the four weeks leading up to the day in which we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. So we remember and we prepare. We remember that Jesus Christ has come into the world and in Jesus was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines into the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it because we know the darkness cannot overcome it, right? Doesn't matter how dark this world gets, the light will shine because Christ lives forever. We remember the true light has come into the world, as John 1, 19 says, and we prepare our hearts to marvel afresh at the good news that Christ has come. We prepare our hearts to marvel afresh that the virgin gave birth to the Son of God, to the Messiah. And so Advent, again, is that time of remembrance, that time of preparation. Advent is a word that means coming. And so we sit here now in between the first Advent, longing for the second Advent of our Lord. We remember that Christ has come, that virgin-born baby who grew up to be the Savior of the world. We remember that Christ is still coming into the lives of all who will repent and call out to him in faith. We remember and we proclaim Christ will come again, and he will reign forever and ever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So Advent is a time to get ready. It's a time to get ready to plan, to prepare, to meet Jesus. It's a time of anticipation and waiting while we celebrate God's most perfect gift, his son, our Lord, our treasure, our hope. So my aim for this morning and my aim for this entire four-week series would be that we can all confidently, without wavering, without apologizing, say, I have hope. I have hope today because of Jesus Christ. Now we can all say, I know that I know that I know that I am loved by God because of Jesus Christ, and now I have joy and peace because of Jesus Christ. That's my aim. I think, honestly, we need to acknowledge we're not all there yet. (laughs) And in Psalm 130, we see where hope is lost and where hope is found. In the first part of this passage, we're going to see that hope is swallowed up as we forget the mercy of God. Hope is swallowed up as we forget the mercy of God. Let's read these first four verses again of Psalm 130. The psalmist says, Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. 
If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. There's one word in in the first part of this that jumps out, that gives us context for the psalm, the reason for the psalm. And that word is depth. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Now, like it or not, depths are a normal part of living in a fallen world. And, and many people, I think with good intentions, I have to believe the best about people until I shouldn't, but many people will say something in the neighborhood of, if you just believed in God, your life would get better and easier. If you believed in God, so much of your hurt and sorrow would just go away. Well, not so fast. We see in Psalm 130, a true follower of the Lord who by his own Holy Spirit inspired word says he's in a place of depth where he's crying out to the Lord. He's overwhelmed. He feels like he's about to be swallowed up. He's about to be engulfed. Maybe we would say he feels like he's drowning. It feels like he's suffocating. You've been there. I can't imagine drowning the psychological toll that it would take on someone. But perhaps we've been there with with grief or with physical pain or financial ruin or some other 2020 (laughs) where we would say, what a depth this has been, where we feel like we're being swallowed up. For 2020 or for this year, I think some have been drowning in fear, anxiety. Some have been drowning in anger been drowning in isolation, swallowed up in sorrow or depression. The darkness is getting darker and darker. Many have lost direction, lost peace. They have lost hope. For the psalmist, the depth was not political. Praise be to God. The depth was not a worldwide pandemic, but it was worse than 2020. Can you believe that something is worse than the political nonsense we've lived under. And oh boy, we're already hearing about the next presidential campaign and this one, goodness gracious. (laughs) Can you believe that there is something worse than worldwide pandemic and all of the change it brought? You know what's worse than that? Sinning against the one true and living God, the maker of heaven and earth, and realizing the depth that sin has brought. Realizing the sorrow. As as I was saying today, it's standing at the foot of Mount Sinai and looking up and feeling like it's about to crash in on you. Because who can ascend the hill of the Lord? Only Only the one with clean hands and a pure heart? Well, that's none of us. Only one who does, the one who does not swear deceitfully, that's none of us. We stand at the foot of the hill and say, I can't. And that's where this psalmist is. He's crying out because the greatest imaginable depth is what he's in as he thinks about the the, the sin that separated him from the Lord. And we need to know that. That is our greatest grief. That is the greatest problem of this world. The sin problem. We don't need the right person in the right office. We don't need the right amount of money in a bank. We don't need the right whatever circumstances. We need the Savior. We need the one mediator between God and man because we've read our Bibles, right? And there is only one God and he is holy and righteous and just. And we know that we, like Adam, with Adam, sinned against God. And we separated ourselves from his goodness, from his mercy, from his love, from his wonderful presence. And we've ached in our heart because of that. And we've groaned and we've cried out, is there any hope? Is there any way? And the Lord boldly, clearly declared, yes, there is a way in Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. And he's come to bring peace at the birth of Christ. There was the announcement of peace between God and man. Do you know the depth of your sin? Have you felt the weight, the sorrow of your sin? If you have, that's actually a kindness from the Lord. Because he's drawing us away from ourselves and drawing us unto himself to trust in 
Him. What's sad is when we, as true followers of the Lord, focus more on our sin than our Savior. We uh, give more time and energy and emotion to our deficiency than His sufficiency. And that's where, as true, redeemed, born-again, uh, 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 spirit-enabled followers of Christ, we will find ourselves in a depth. Though fully forgiven, fully redeemed, we will find ourselves in a depth of sin because we've taken our eyes off of Jesus and begun to look into the mirror. And there's an old Puritan pastor, Richard Sibbs. He says the only way to cover, or excuse me, the only way, yeah, to cover our sin is to uncover it by confession. The only way to cover our sin is to uncover it by confession. And this same pastor also said, and this is such good news, there is more mercy in Christ than sin in us. Now, I, I set out quite frequently, Lord willing, it's not as much as it used to be, but from time to time, it's like my heart just gets so committed to proving that not being true. I test the Lord and I give myself over to sin and various expressions of pride. And when it hits me, I have the crisis moment of, have I gone too far? Have I sinned beyond the mercy of God? And I know in my finer moments, that's just not possible. But what I'm startled by this morning is there's more mercy in Christ than sin in us combined. And there's more mercy in Christ than sin in this world combined. The sin of this world will grow exhausted and tap out before the love and mercy of God and Christ will grow exhausted and tap out. He endures forever. And so the calling here is to, is to remember something. And that's what we see in verses 3 and 4. Look at this good news. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? That's the right, righteous, fair question. Who, who could climb the hill of the Lord? Who could walk? Who could draw near to God with any, any shred of confidence is what he's asking. Verse 4, but with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. With you there's forgiveness that we may tremble in awe of who you are. The verse, verse 3, the word if, makes it sound conditional, right? If you, O Lord, kept a record of sin, makes it sound conditional. But it's not conditional. It is true. God does keep a record of sin. But the goodness of God, his mercy to us is revealed in Colossians 2, 13 and 14. When it says Jesus became the record of sin that was held against us. So God is taking perfect note of our sin, of our rebellion. Colossians 2, 13-14 says that perfect record was placed on Christ when he was crucified for us. Is that not astounding? That every one of our sins, as this says, the marks of iniquity, every one of them correctly recorded by the holy God was placed on Christ. And it says there in Colossians 2 that he forgave us all our trespasses. So not just the past transgressions. But, you know, before Christmas, we will all sin against God enough to be damned to hell. In fact, I was being very generous there. Before our head hit the pillow, hits the pillow tonight, we will all have sinned against God sufficient enough to be eternally separated. But all of that future sin has already been paid for by Jesus. All of our sin has been atoned for. Hence this crying out. But with you there is forgiveness that you be, may be feared. In other words, the psalmist is saying, if you held my sins over me, I would be ruined. However, I know, I, know, I remember you held my sin over another. Now I can confidently cry out to you out of the depth, my self-inflicted depth, because I have been forgiven. All of my sins have been forgiven. That's why we're not hopeless. Is the greatest sorrow, the greatest problem has already been addressed. And every other sorrow and every other problem is far lesser than our sin against the Lord. So we're not hopeless. He who is faithful in much, I'm flipping it around now. He who is faithful in much, speaking of the Lord, is faithful in little. Speaking of all the circumstances of our life. And so the Lord 
burst into the darkness of this world through his son, shining light into the darkness, the darkness of our own heart, giving us new life. And by his grace, we have received him by faith. So then my heart's desire, my appeal is don't focus too much on your sin. Don't focus too much on your shortcoming, your deficiency, whatever it may be. Don't study yourself in the mirror. Overly critique yourself. Study the Savior. Behold the King. And marvel at His glory. This is why another man said for every Ten looks at, or for every one look itself, take ten looks at Christ. So I'm asking you, do you see Jesus this morning? Have you caught a, a sight of Jesus this morning? Have you been able to recall he lives today to make intercession for you? H- have you seen the Lord praying for you today? He's not up there accusing you right now. He's not up there inflicting you and wounding you right now. He's up there interceding for you, praying for you. Can you see the throne of grace that has been purchased by the blood of Christ that's offering us free invitation to draw near in confidence? Can you see Jesus? Can you hear Jesus on the cross speaking of all the righteous requirements of God and all the shortcomings of man shouting, it is finished? Can you hear that call of Christ today? That dying word, but that victorious word. It is finished. We lose hope when we forget the gospel. When we forget the mercy of God in Christ. But I also know this. That the depth for you may not be your sin. Okay? Maybe you've walked through this glorious door of grace. And you never doubt your salvation. And you never knowingly, willfully rebel against God. And you just, you're lavished in his love and you walk with incredible peace. So maybe your depth is something like a physical sickness. And you can't imagine surviving another day. Well, again, we need to remember that Jesus bought our place in heaven. And he's there preparing it for us. And this physical sickness has an expiration date. It will die one day and you will rise perfect free maybe it's isolation maybe it's feeling abandoned feeling forgotten again remember jesus was forgotten he was isolated he was abandoned suffering all alone so that you so that i would never suffer alone friend brother sister you are not alone I don't care if there's anybody in the room with you that you can lay eyes on. If there's nobody there, you are not alone. The gospel guarantees it. He's with us. He is Emmanuel. Maybe the death is some family dynamic. And my word, a gift like Thanksgiving should be something to celebrate. But sometimes it's the most bitter time of the year. And Christmas just brings dread as we face sorrow and regret. Remember, Jesus bought a family for you to belong to. He purchased a family, a people. And yes, we're not perfect, but he's making us perfect. And one day our imperfection will give way to perfection and we will abide in Christ together forever. And that's how we fight the depths of this world is going back to the person and the work of Jesus, remembering who he is and all that he accomplished. Remember the already not yet. He's already accomplished something, but he's not yet given us everything. There's more to come for those that belong to Christ. So whatever the depth is, don't give way to the depth by focusing on the depth, but lift your eyes to the Lord. Remember the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Remember, like this psalmist, to cry out to the Lord in the depth, not giving in and drowning. This may surprise you, but the psalmist is not hopeless, is he? No, he starts with this incredible moment of drowning, but he's certainly not hopeless. It was real, whatever it was. It was swallowing it up, whatever it was, but he was not hopeless. Why? Because he remembered. And we experience hope when we remember to wait patiently on the Lord. We experience hope when we long for the Lord, when we anticipate the faithfulness of the Lord. So circumstances aren't necessarily changing. The focus of our heart has changed. 
from sorrow to Savior. We've lifted our eyes from the cares of this world, from the pain of this world. And we see the one that is omnipotent, eternally strong. So he says, beginning in verse 5, I wait. Which, by the way, the word wait and the word hope in the Hebrew are synonyms. Not in the English language, are they? (laughs) They're antonyms. Is that the right word? Okay. But But in Hebrew, they can be used interchangeably because they're conveying one and the same thing. So he says here, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits. And it would be right to say, I hope in the Lord, my soul hopes. And in his word, I hope, in his word, I wait. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. Oh, Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord, there is steadfast love and with him is plentiful redemption. And he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. The psalmist is waiting. And I wish somebody would have told me when the Lord saved me, waiting is the common experience of the true follower of Christ. Do you know why? Because waiting has been the true common experience of every true follower of Yahweh since Genesis 3. When sin entered into the world, And God made that first gospel promise that from the woman would come a champion, would come a warrior, would come one that would crush the head of the serpent. From that day through this day, we are marked by a people that will wait. And generation after generation, all through the Old Testament, you have this anticipation, this man of God rising up, thinking perhaps this is the one only to fall. And they stop and they wait for the next man. And they waited and they waited and they waited until Christ came, realizing he is the long awaited, much anticipated Messiah of God who would crush the head of the serpent. And so Christ's coming was a clear declaration that God keeps covenant. God keeps his promise and his people never wait in vain. So if you need endurance to wait now, look back to the prior faithfulness of God and let that inform your present waiting and hope upon the Lord. But for some of us, waiting is why we feel hopeless, right? Because waiting on the Lord in our experience many times is like waiting on the doctor. No offense to anyone in the medical uh, profession, But we all know if you get a 9 a.m. appointment with a doctor, it'll be 940 before he, she comes in to actually give you time and care. That's just our system. And, And we grow frustrated with that because we have things to do, don't we? We have plans for the day. We have plans for our lives. We have people that we want to be around or things we need to accomplish. And so waiting for us in that environment is an interruption to something. And then we, we throw that experience back upon the Lord, and that's why we're hopeless. It's because we see waiting on the Lord like we're waiting on the doctor. God, I had this great plan for my life, and you've said, no, not now, and now you want me to wait. All you've done, God, is interrupted my good intention, well-thought-out, wise plans. And we groan, and we're restless, and we're hopeless. But that's not what we're talking about here when it says, I wait upon the Lord. This wait upon the Lord is anticipate God being God. It's, it's posturing your heart with, a, with, a, with a, hu- a, a humble spirit saying, I know that God is God. I know that God is good. I know that God is faithful. And I will wait until I see the unfolding of all of that stuff. Because God is who God is and God does according to his nature. I will wait. I will hope in the Lord. So waiting is not an interruption to the plan. Waiting is is the plan. Waiting is not an interruption to all the work that we want to get done in this world or for the Lord. Waiting is the work that God has called us to because waiting is is, is spurring on worship and it's renewing us in his strength. Waiting, it's frustrating, right? Because it draws out ugly things in our heart, a complaining heart. 
It draws out self-reliance. It draws out any remaining pride. It draws out restlessness and anxiety because we, we come to grips with we're not sovereign. We're not in control. And we hate to wait. But God loves us so much that He says, my child, wait. Because God is committed to being the crystal clear hero of your life. To being the champion. To being the one that is praised, the one that is trusted, the one that is loved and adored and treasured above all. Waiting transforms us from the fallen pattern of this world into the image of the Son who did wait. Who said repeatedly, my time has not yet come. You, you think Jesus could have called the legion of angels to destroy everyone who dishonored him. But he humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross, because he waited and he was willing to wait for God to exalt him to the highest place and for God to give him the name that is above every name. Humility comes before glory. So we wait. We wait and trust God. You be God. You show your nature. You show your character. You show your fame and your glory. But we say, not to us, O Lord. Not to us. But to your name be all the glory. And he says, hallelujah, wait. (laughs) Trust me. To wait on the Lord is to take your hands off whatever the control mechanism is, the steering wheel, whatever it is. And you let God, you let God control. You remember the old license plate, or maybe it's the license plate holder that said, like, God or Jesus is my co-pilot? I hope you don't have it on your car. If you do, please take it off. He's not giving you back control. No, he's the pilot. We're the cargo in the back. And he's flying us to glory. And we go up there and fight against him. We try to land in what we think is glory. And it's just more hurt. And it's more pain. What I'm getting at is waiting renews hope. Because waiting is upon the Lord. Waiting necessarily calls us to fix our eyes on the one who's able. Waiting renews us. This passage here is saying that God is faithful, that He's full of steadfast love, verse 7. Verse 8 says He will redeem His people. Verse 7, He provides plentiful redemption. Aren't you glad the redemption that God is providing us is not being doled out with an eyedropper? Bloop, bloop, bloop. Is that enough for you now? No, it's lavish. It's, it's swallowing us. We think we're going to be swallowed by pain and sorrow, but instead what happens is we, we now remember the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, and we're not swallowed in sorrow. We're swallowed in redemption, and we wait. And we hope. Psalm 30, so, excuse me, Psalm 130. God is referred to as the Lord. You see this, right? It's verse 1, verse 3, verse 5, verse 7. And then the people of God are referred to as Israel, verse 7. And the reason I point this out is hope is only found in the Lord. And I say that very clearly, very concisely. Hope is only found in the Lord, in Yahweh. And so God is being referred to here by name, not by title. The people of God are being referred to by name, not by title. What all this is getting at is hope is realized when we have a personal relationship with God, the Almighty. When we have a personal, intimate, communing relationship with the Lord. I know so many people that will say, I'm good with the man upstairs. I have no problem with God. They'll say things like that in the most vague, generic terms, thinking they're okay. That's not at all what the Bible is talking about. It's talking about a personal intimate relationship with the Lord, with Yahweh. And we know the name means I am. And we know that when Jesus came to earth, he said before Abraham was, I am. And he declared himself to be Yahweh in flesh. So this hope is something that Jesus died for. It's something as a grace, as a gift, he's imparted to us that no circumstance takes away Because the blood of Jesus gave it to us 
uh, permanently sealed us in it. The Holy Spirit is the guarantee by which we cry, Abba, Father. So circumstances rise and fall. Darkness gives, gives way to brilliant light, and then the light seems to fade in our lives from time to time. But what must not change is hope, because the Lord is the same. Do you know the Lord? Do you know the Lord? I'm not asking you, do you know stuff about the Lord? I'm asking, do you know Jesus? Not as an historical figure, not as some theological construct, not, not as something you would see on television. I mean, do you personally know Jesus? Do you know his voice? Do you know his presence? Do you know his love and his care? That's what, that's what all of this is about. That's what our whole existence is about, to know Jesus. God becoming flesh to buy us out of slavery. That's what the incarnation was aimed at, in love to reconcile us, to bring peace between God and man. And what saddens me and frustrates me is the stronghold that this world, the flesh and the devil have on so many people and they're deceived. They know a lot about the Lord. but They don't know him. They don't know what it is to sit down and abide, rest, lean all of your weight on Christ, to lean on him for life, for peace, for joy. And the psalmist here is, is, is paving the way or showing the way. It's to remember, if you're separate from the Lord today, that's your own doing. But if you will call out, cry out to him, you'll know forgiveness of sin. You'll know hope. And so many of us are just running ourselves ragged through this world and hope is offered to us. And we say, no, I can earn it. No, just a little bit more, then I'll have it. And Christ is there saying, I've purchased it. I am hope for you. And so do you know the Lord? If not, cry out to him. And if, and if you know someone that doesn't know the Lord, cry out to the Lord on their behalf now. Right now, God have mercy. God speak. God soften her heart. Turn his head back to you. Give him clear sight of your wonder, of your mercy and your love. Hope is only for those that surrender. Stop kicking against, fighting against, but surrender, trust, receive. Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Some of you already know Christ. You know Him as your Savior. You know Him as your Lord. You're already a part of this family that we call the church, the covenant people of God that will experience this steadfast love and this plentiful redemption, who've already experienced the redemption from all iniquities. And yet, you're thinking that the idea of living the rest of my life like this is beyond me. I can't. I won't. I won't live with that person. I'm tired of waiting on God to do something. I'm done. I won't stay in that marriage. I'm tired of waiting upon God to change the spouse. I'm done. I won't live with that illness. I read yesterday of a senior adult lady who committed suicide. Coronavirus just did her in. She didn't have the virus. She was tired of being isolated. I'm tired of living this way. She gave up. I'm tired of waiting on you, God, to give me help at work. I'm tired of waiting. And the rest of life feels hopeless like this. I want you to know the Bible speaks to that. In the book of Lamentations, which means like profound grief, crying out, lament. Lamentations chapter 3. Verse 18, this true follower of the Lord spoke this way. My endurance has perished. So is my hope for the Lord. Remember my affliction, 
and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down. Some of you know that. Maybe you wouldn't say it in those exact words, and I'm saying the Bible articulates your grief. It's there. And it's inviting you to walk into that and own that. In that, what are you to do? Cry out. Cry out to the Lord. Don't run from it. Don't pretend it's not there. We see in Psalm 30, 130, cry out because God hears you. Cry out because God loves you. Cry out because He's already, through Christ, canceled the record of sin that stood against you. Cry out, but then watch. More than watchmen wait for the morning. More than, it's, it's added for repetition there. Uh, the, the repetition is added for emphasis there. More than watchmen. Don't fall asleep on guard duty. Don't let your guard down. More eager More focused than watchmen on the wall looking for the enemy to come. More than we watch out for the enemy of the world. We're watching out for the goodness of the Lord. More than watchmen wait for the morning. Cry out and watch. And you know what you're going to see on the horizon? I promise you, not because I'm faithful, but because God is faithful. If you will cry out and watch, if you will cry out to the Lord in faith, you will read on in in Lamentations chapter 3 and you will see, but this I call to mind. And therefore, I have a hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies are new every morning. uh, His mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Some of us are in the depth because we refuse to cry out. And Christmas is saying, cry out, oh child, cry out. Because I've heard your cry. I've heard the cry from darkness and light has burst into the world. Walk out of darkness into the marvelous light that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And hope in him today. To be quieted by his presence today. And we say, 2020, thanks for giving it your best shot. But we have Jesus and we're okay. Amen.